Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this presentation, we will resume our discussion of blood pressure regulation, focusing on the role of the kidney. We are literally resuming our discussion, as I just chopped the previous recording in half, as the autonomic nervous system is such a schnoozer. So here it goes. Just to set the stage, we're moving on to the renal response to hypoperfusion. Note, for low blood pressure, there is a fairly immediate pressor response by angiotensin II. The volume restoration response, however, mediated by aldosterone, takes place over a matter of days. On the other hand, if the blood pressure gets too high, the kidney can respond through a pressure called pressure naturesis, where we secrete excess sodium, and or the process of pressure diuresis, where we secrete excess water. And here's what that looks like. This graphic demonstrates the urinary output curve. You can see, as the mean arterial pressure rises, the urine output can double, triple, and beyond. This is triggered by a rise in the intraglomerular pressure. And here is the major derivative that comes up repeatedly in discussions of SIADH and hyperaldosteronism. Students are angry at the notion that SIADH can be described as a euvolemic state. They assume you're absorbing all that extra water, so the patient should be volume overload. Here it is pressure diuresis. You hit a point and the kidney starts secreting the excess water. A similar phenomenon is seen with excess aldosterone. There is a finite amount of sodium resorption that takes place before your kidney starts dumping the excess. And for completeness, recall the heart also responds to chamber stretch with release of natriuretic peptides. These are reviewed more completely in the heart failure videos. The natriuretic peptides, however, play a role in controlling volume but not blood pressure per se. Well, that was fun. Let's get into the real action, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Lots of descriptions on location, but I like the hilum of the glomerulus. The hilum makes it sound like the lung. And everyone knows that the kidneys and lungs are pals, but that's a separate topic. All right, so who are the players? Here they are. Renin secreting juxtaglomerular cells, the macula densa, and the extraglomerular mesangial cells. The contribution of the mesangial cells are uncertain and has no implication for the boards, so you can take that off your bucket list. But you will need to be familiar with the description of the juxtaglomerular cells or granule cells. These are described as modified, smooth muscle cells located in the walls of the terminal portion of the afferent arteriole. They function to synthesize, store, and secrete renin. That is a mouthful. Whereas you won't be asked about the mechanism of renin release, you will need to be familiar with the triggers to be reviewed. Nonetheless, it is easy to remember triggers if you know what they are doing. Renin release is a cyclic AMP-mediated process. Prostaglandins and beta agonists are two key triggers. Also, in a process referred to as the calcium paradox, a decreased intracellular calcium concentration triggers renin release. This is interesting, but irrelevant to your purposes. Sticking with the juxtaglomerular apparatus, let's move on to the macula densa. These are described as a collection of modified epithelial cells located in the distal convoluted tubule. The function of the macula densa is to detect changes in tubular salt concentration. When there is ample salt detected, in a process referred to as tubuloglomerular feedback, the afferent arterial constricts and renin release is inhibited. If a low concentration of salt is detected, as in volume depletion, renin release is triggered. The two main mediators of this process are adenosine and prostaglandins. Remember, adenosine in the kidney functions as a vasoconstrictor, turning off the release of renin. So we just reviewed the components of the juxtaglomerular apparatus, but how is renin release regulated? Here it is. There are three major components. First, the afferent arteriole itself exhibits a myogenic response. That is, like other baroreceptors, it responds to stretch. Increased stretch leads to decreased renin release. The second trigger for renin are the beta-1 adrenal receptors. Increased sympathetic outflow from the autonomic nervous system will stimulate renin release. And do be aware, this is the mechanism of action for beta blockers in the management of hypertension. That is, they block this trigger. And the third relevant trigger for renin release is the macula densa, which we just discussed. Decreased salt means more renin. Although basic physiology, I need to take one quick walk through the events following renin release. We know that renin doesn't have any vasoactive properties of its own. 
Its claim to fame is the conversion of hepatically synthesized angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. For all the excitement about renin, that is the extent of its action. Angiotensin 1 is converted by angiotensin converting enzyme, predominantly found in the pulmonary vascular beds, into angiotensin 2. Unlike renin, angiotensin 2 is a big shot. As they say in The Sopranos, it gets things done. Angiotensin 2 stimulates absorption of sodium and bicarbonate in the proximal convoluted tubule, and it stimulates ADH release from the posterior pituitary. But wait, there's more. Through stimulation of aldosterone synthase in the adrenal glomerulosa, it facilitates the conversion of corticosterone to aldosterone. But its number one and most immediate impact on blood pressure regulation is the direct effect on vascular smooth muscle, resulting in vasoconstriction. When arterial hypoperfusion is present, renin stimulates this cascade of events with the goal of restoring blood pressure and thereby arterial perfusion and, of course, its own self-serving needs of renal perfusion from any cause. And when renal perfusion is restored, renin release is inhibited until the next cycle of renal hypoperfusion. All right, you've been reasonably patient, so let's eyeball a few special scenarios. Here they are. We'll review a slide on each. These are chosen as they each highlight a unique component of blood pressure regulation. So what happens when your patients with cerebral injury present to the emergency room with very high blood pressure? straightforward. In the setting of ischemia, the brain perceives hypoperfusion and the vasomotor center triggers vasoconstriction. The blood pressure elevations can be very dramatic. Boom! Scenario number two, coarctation. So why does the patient with coarctation become hypertensive? It is not because of the stenotic segment. We know it isn't related to the autonomic nervous system as the peripheral baroreceptors just turn a blind eye to the elevated values after a day or two. So what's going on? Here it is. The kidney is being hypoperfused. The coarctation decreases blood delivery to the kidney, and for reasons discussed earlier, renin is released. This scenario highlights the dissonance between renal perfusion and systemic blood pressure. Third scenario is the old issue between aortic compliance and blood pressure. Here's the rule. If the blood volume increases and vascular capacitance is not altered, arterial pressure must rise. And where does this catchy little concept show up? Aortic regurgitation and chronic anemia. Both situations are associated with an increase in stroke volume. The higher volume translates into a widened pulse pressure. And finally, what happens to blood pressure during exercise? Whereas we have an increase in sympathetic outflow, the blood pressure demonstrates only a modest elevation. Why is that? In a word, vasodilation. Vasodilation drops the systemic vascular resistance, and how does that occur? Answer, epinephrine. Epinephrine stimulates beta-2 receptors that cause vasodilation. But the more important mechanism is attributed to local mediators, specifically lactate, adenosine, and release of intracellular potassium. All these agents stimulate skeletal muscle vasodilation, mitigating the rise in blood pressure during exercise. The net effect is a relatively minor increase in mean arterial pressure during exercise as a result of increased cardiac output. And here is a summary of those four special scenarios in blood pressure regulation or dysregulation. In the remainder of this series, we'll explore renovascular hypertension and conclude with the endocrinopathies. And that will do it for this presentation on blood pressure regulation. If you have any questions or concerns, drop me a post. Thank you.